Hi, my name is Madison. I'm a law student at Texas A&M University School of Law. I'm also part of the Family and Veterans Advocacy Clinic. Today, I'm going to be showing you a presentation on knowing your rights, as well as how to prepare in the event of a deportation. You will first see a presentation on knowing your rights. After that, you'll see a presentation on how to prepare in the case of a deportation. Thank you. Conoce tus derechos y planificación en caso de deportación o detención. Conoce tus derechos. Los extranjeros, incluso los extranjeros cuya presencia en este país es ilegal, han sido reconocidos durante mucho tiempo como personas garantizadas por el debido proceso legal por las enmiendas quinta y décimo cuarta. La Corte Suprema de los Estados Unidos, 1982. Las garantías de la Constitución se aplican a todas las personas dentro de los EEUU, incluidas las personas indocumentadas. Sin registros e incautaciones irrazonables, pero los registros en la frontera no se considerarán irrazonables. Las personas indocumentadas tienen derecho al debido proceso. Caídas del debido proceso. Algunas personas indocumentadas pueden no obtener una audiencia. Los solicitantes de asilo deben obtener una audiencia. Proceso de la eliminación acelerado. Menos de dos años en los EEUU o el estado dentro de 100 millas de la frontera o puede ser deportado casi inmediatamente sin una audiencia. La mayoría de las personas que enfrentan la deportación tienen derecho a audiencia ante un juez de inmigración o revisión por un tribunal federal o un, abaga, un abogado no a expensas del gobierno o notificación de la hora y el lugar de la audiencia o aviso de cargos o oportunidad de examinar pruebas y testigos o interpretación competente o prueba clara convenciente de que la deportación es válida. Protección contra la autoincriminación. Derecho a permanecer en silencio y con derecho a la advertencia de Miranda. Derecho a un abogado en casos finales. Si una persona es demasiado pobre, se la nombrará un abogado. Recuerde, la mayoría de los procedimientos de deportación son casos civiles, por lo que el derecho a la asesoría legal no siempre se aplica. Las personas indocumentadas tienen derecho a un juicio con jurado, sí, caso criminal y posibilidad de deportación. Las personas indocumentadas tienen los mismos derechos laborales básicos que los demás trabajadores. Salario mínimo y límite de la semana laboral de 40 horas y pago por tiempo extra y derecho a afiliarse a sindicatos o derecho a negociar con los empleadores. Libre de prácticas laborales injustas, los empleadores y las organizaciones laborales no pueden discriminar en función de la raza, color, sexo, religión, origen nacional. Derecho a los salarios prometidos no se le puede exigir que compre bienes o servicios únicamente del empleador. Derecho a información escrita sobre salarios y condiciones de trabajo en, una, en un idioma que pueden entender.
vivienda y transporte seguros si el empleador los proporciona. Si un trabajador indocumentado ha sido discriminado, varias organizaciones están disponibles para ayudar, como Comisión de Igualdad de Oportunidades en el Empleo, EEOC, y División de Horas y Salarios, WHD, del Departamento de Trabajo de EEUU. Junta Nacional de Relaciones Laborales, NLRB. Hay muchos más derechos para los trabajadores indocumentados en los Estados Unidos. Para más información, por favor, vaya a texaslawhelp.org. Derechos laborales de los trabajadores indocumentados. Y visité este sitio web. Hay otros derechos, como el derecho a presentar demandas civiles, educación pública gratuita, KA12, y protección contra la discriminación ilegal en el empleo, la educación, vivienda y lugares públicos, por ejemplo, restaurantes y hoteles. Hello, my name is Reba George. I am a law student at Texas A&M and in the Family and Veterans Advocacy Clinic. In this segment, we will cover the importance of family planning in the event of detention or deportation. A person living in the U.S. without legal immigration status can save important documents, avoid problems with the law, know their rights if they are arrested, find a trusted person to care for their children, and consult with an immigration attorney or contact local legal aid. This past July, U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement published a new directive. This ensures that parents and legal guardians who are detained or deported can make decisions about the care of their children and continue to participate in child welfare and family court proceedings. The policy protects parents of minor children and incapacitated adults. If an ICE agent encounters a non-citizen, the agent is supposed to ask about their parental status. ICE must also ask that the parent has someone to care for the child. If ICE insists on arresting the parent, they must wait to arrest the parent until plans about the child can be made. If no arrangements can be made, ICE agents will ask local child welfare or law enforcement agency to take custody of the children. ICE agents cannot take custody or transport the children themselves. ICE should try to detain the parents locally so that the children can visit and allow the parent to participate in their ongoing case proceedings. If the parent faces deportation, ICE will allow the parent to make plans with the child's caregiver or the parent can obtain travel documents for the child if they want the child to accompany them to their home country. However, this is not the law for ICE agents and we don't know if they will follow these guidelines or if there will be an opportunity to find proper care for your children while detained. Therefore, you should still carefully plan ahead of time with your family. In this presentation, we will discuss these legal options for parents of minor children in the event of detention or deportation. First, we will consider the authorization for non-parent care of a child. This is an easier option for parents and does not require going in front of a judge. This form is available online. By signing this, the parent allows the caregiver authorization to a few responsibilities, such as getting medical treatment for the child, enrolling them in school, or obtaining the child's public benefits. The parent can choose which rights they want to give to the caregiver. The authorization is valid for six months and is renewable, but you can always terminate the authorization. An issue is that if a parent disagrees as to the caregiver or any responsibilities, they could argue in court over the agreement. Second is a temporary authorization for care of a minor child. This is a more formal method where you have to go to the court and get the judge's signature. The parent can authorize the caregiver to any of these responsibilities mentioned before. This is not the same as giving them custody. The parent will have all of the same rights as they had before signing. There are three requirements. The child must live with the caregiver for 30 days. 
there must not be a current agreement in place and a parent must agree to the caregiver or if it's contested the judge will dismiss the case you can ask the court to terminate the order when you don't need it this method is more expensive however and could also be dangerous or possibly raise suspicion of a parent's status next is a power of attorney this also gives a non-parent permission to care for the child you can decide when this becomes effective such as the moment when the parent is either detained or deported, when it is signed, or you can hold on to it and wait to give them the document. The non-parent can do other things related to finances, including things going on with the apartment or home, paying bills, or dealing with property. If you choose not to give them rights about your children, you should consider getting a power of attorney for these financial issues. You can decide what the non-parent can do, but whatever decision they end up making is on you. They are acting for you. One issue is that you may have to go to court to get this honored. Also, a parent could contest this issue in court. Last is the suit affecting a parent-child relationship. This is used as a last resort option. This requires going to court and attending hearings unless you and the caregiver can agree to everything and just get the judge to sign. It is important to gather your documents and keep them in a safe location. You should make copies of them and you should inform your family where the documents are kept and when they will need to use them. When you have decided who will take care of your children and what rights you will give them, you should give them copies of these documents. Please have a conversation with your children about what to do if a parent is detained or deported. If a parent is detained, ICE has a website to locate them using their alien registration number. Some other considerations include notifying the children's school. If you don't do this, the school could call CPS to get the child if no one is at school to pick them up because you have been detained. Also, the school should know if another adult has authority to pick them up or who to contact in emergencies. Getting dual citizenship for children who are U.S. citizens. A parent may want the child to come to the home country to live with them. If the child has citizenship there, they can receive benefits, get access to health care, and enroll in school. Getting dual citizenship eliminates the need to get a travel visa. If the child remains in the U.S. but the parent wants the child to be able to come visit them, it will make it easier if the child has citizenship and a passport from that country because they don't need to get a visa. Here are some legal aid resources. Please consider talking to an attorney. On behalf of the Texas A&M Family and Veterans Advocacy Clinic, thank you for listening.